Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John. I'm a, a first year movement disorder fellow at the University of Florida. Over the next 40 minutes or so, we are going to talk a little bit about the advanced therapies for Parkinson's disease. Disclosures, so my training at the University of Florida is uh, sponsored by the Michael J. Fox Foundation and the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation. Uh, so here's the outline. We are going to briefly talk about Parkinson's disease and the motor complications. And then we're going to talk about when to consider advanced therapies. And we'll take a uh, dive into the various advanced therapies. Uh, and then in the end, we'll talk about how do you choose between those therapies. And then we'll briefly touch upon some of the investigational therapies. So Parkinson's disease. Um, as people are aware, uh, so Parkinson's disease was first described by, doctor, by an English physician, Dr. James Parkin, uh, in 1817. And then 50 years later, Dr. Charcot uh, expounded on the disease and renamed it Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is caused by degeneration of the dopamine producing uh, neurons in the brain. And then the degeneration is caused by accumulation of, or abnormal accumulation of the uh, alpha synuclein protein in the brain that's called Lewy bodies. Um, the Parkin uh, as the dopamine producing neuron degenerate, um, there can be a lot of symptoms that we don't see initially, uh, that people can have various premotor symptoms, uh, such as the decrease of smell or taste, um, the sleep issues where they um, have vivid dreams and act out of their dreams, constipation and other things. Uh, when you lose about 50% of the neurons, typically the um, movement symptoms start to occur. And that's where the classic description of the cardinal motor symptoms um, consisting of the bradykinesia, where you, uh, there's a progressive uh, reduction of the speed and amplitude of the movements. And the resting tremor, the muscle rigidity or stiffness um, start to occur. And then um, as the, de the degeneration continues, um, people start to notice the the, uh, the dyskinesias, the motor fluctuations in about five to 10 years after. And then 10 years after, there starts to, uh, uh, to have more balance problems and gait problems. That said, Parkinson's is not just a motor dis uh, disorder. There are also a lot of non-motor sim symptoms uh, spending from thinking and memory, mood, autonomic function, sleep, and sensory issues. Uh, I think this slide has been shown multiple times today. <laughs> so 20 years or so before the start of the motor symptoms, uh, people would start to notice premotor symptoms. And then there's a steady progression of non-motor symptoms. Uh, and then when the degeneration hits about 50%, there starts to become the uh, motor issues. And as the disease continues, there's progression of both motor and non-motor issues. With that said, here comes the motor fluctuations. Uh, so anytime someone take a medication, uh, the concentration rises, and then as the medication gets metabolized, the concentration drops. Before Parkinson's, um, your brain is producing a good amount of dopamine, and you have a white uh, window where um, the bottom line is how much dopamine your brain needs to f uh, move appropriately, and the top line is how much brain, uh, dopamine the brain can handle before it starts to have some extra movements. Uh, as uh, early on in the course of Parkinson's, uh, the dopamine production is a little bit less than what the brain needs. So you can take a medication, um, may maybe one tablet three times a day, to bring your dopamine level to this range of concentration, uh, to this range uh, without any issues. You may have a little bit of a sort of wearing off when you first wake up, and if you delay or forget a dose, you may notice a little bit of wearing off. But in general, um, people are in this honeymoon period where, they're, where they are doing pretty well. As the condition uh, continues, the windows, the therapeutic window is getting smaller, and then people may start to require more uh, medications. Towards the advanced phase of Parkinson's, the therapeutic window is really tight, and uh, that, and then there's not a lot of production of dopamine in the brain itself, and that requires frequent dose of medications, and people can have both issues when the medication's concentration is low, or with wearing off, and when the medication concentration is high, higher than the threshold, with dyskinesias. 
Also, as Parkinson's uh, progresses, the half-life of the dopamine in, the, um, in this part of the brain also shortens. So early on, it may, the half-life may last about six hours, but in the more advanced phase, it may only last about half an hour to two hours. Um, so in general, the advanced therapies are uh, geared toward trying to improve the time that people have, uh, people are on without the dyskinesias and reduce the time that people feel off. So it, uh, this slide is small, but uh, that's more for me. And you don't really need to read the specific details on this slide. So advanced Parkinson's, or let's say advanced therapies, um, when to start consider those. It's maybe logical to think when there's advanced Parkinson's, but advanced Parkinson's uh, is actually very hard to define. In, uh, there are multiple studies um, looking at how people define advanced Parkinson's, and in general, the consensus is that it's best defined based on the symptoms uh, and then the functionality of a per person rather than the disease duration or the response to treatment. Uh, various clinical tools have been developed over the years to help clinicians decide when the, uh, a person may have a sort of adequate control of their Parkinson's symptoms, when medication adjustments are needed, and when advanced therapies may be considered. Uh, one of the examples is the 5 to 1 cr sort of criteria, where uh, the, the person may require five or more doses of levodopa through, uh, per day and they may have two, more, two or more hours of off time and one or more hour of uh, troublesome dyskinesia. Uh, patient selection is very important for when you consider advanced therapies and by far the best predictor of the uh, sort of good outcomes for various device assisted therapy is the response to levodopa. And also, as we said, the, the, the advanced therapies are geared towards trying to uh, optimize the uh, troublesome dyskinesia and optimize the uh, on time. So in general, uh, those are the sort of, the people need to demonstrate a clear response to levodopa and also has those symptoms. Now, the best results of the advanced therapies are generally not going to be better than your best sort of outcomes on levodopa, with the exception of uh, medication refractory tremor. Uh, so when that happens, there are certain therapies that may show uh, superiority than the medication, and we'll talk about those later. In general, cognitions are not something that's going to be helped by advanced therapies, as well as levodopa unresponsive uh, axial symptoms, such as the balance problems, the walking problems, the speech problems, swallow problems, or the freezing of gait, uh, when, even when the medication is on. And the freezing of gait means that some people, when they walk, they f their feet sort of start to get stuck on the floor. Um, for the non-motor symptoms, um, those that respond to levodopa when it's on, uh, sometimes can be improved by the advanced therapies. And for the case of DBS, the non-motor symptoms when people experience when um, the concentration is above the threshold uh, can be improved if the DBS leads to a reduction of the medications. Also for DBS, uh, there's a concept of a window of opportunity where uh, uh, you, we, it's indicated when you start to have some troublesome dyskinesia, some motor fluctuations, but also it, it's, it has to be before you start to develop uh, refractory symptoms such as the, uh, the gait issues and the, dementia, uh, the cognitive issues. The advanced therapies are generally indicated only for Parkinson's disease and uh, not for the secondary Parkinsonism where it's caused by a stroke or it's caused by medications or a typical Parkinsonian syndrome, such as the uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, uh, multi-system atrophy, or other disorders. Um, mild cognitive impairment can be considered uh, when it comes to advanced therapies, including DBS. However, when it's uh, severe dementia is involved, usually those uh, advanced therapies are uh, not indicated. Uh, 
There have been some studies suggesting that, in general, if someone is having an active psychiatric issue, such as depression, hallucinations, anxiety, it's better to defer the advanced therapies until those are more controlled. Uh, and there have been some sort of concern that uh, STNDBS, and we'll talk about what that means later, uh, may increase the risk of suicidality, uh, although it's, this sort of concern has not been firmly established, but in general, it's a good idea to screen uh, potential candidates for those issues. That said, the evaluation and care of someone with advanced therapies require a village. In the center, there's the patient, and on the outside, there's pa uh, family, caregivers, neurologists, neurosurgeons, uh, uh, psychiatrists, neuropsychologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, speech therapists for speech and swallow, uh, nutritionists, genetics sometimes, uh, and social work, nursing care or home health care if needed, um, and then also uh, people uh, with advanced therapies a lot of times would need a uh, support from the industrial representative or clinician, uh, clinical educator. Um, and on the research side, uh, there's also a lot of people involved, including biomedical engineers. Uh, and as Parkinson's disease also involve other issues, so primary care doctors, GI doctor, uh, the gastroenterologist, uh, eye doctors, or urologists are also uh, frequently uh, involved for the care. So now let's talk about the conventional leasing, uh, lesioning procedures. Um, so earlier I talked about Parkinson's uh, disease as the degeneration of the dopamine producing neurons. Now I also want you to think of Parkinson's disease as a, a disturbance of the uh, circuitry or the network of the various parts of the brain. So um, different parts of the brain tend to talk to each other and some parts are more uh, ex excitatory like sort of stepping on the gas and other parts are more inhibitory, like stepping on the, uh, on the brake. And then normally it requires the balance of the gas and the brake for the movements to act out smoothly without issues. And in Parkinson's disease, overall there's a uh, sort of too much of a, a, a brake and then not enough gas, so then people are not moving it very well and things like that. I don't know if you can. If you can see this, uh, maybe you can. Um, a little bit of history. So in, in starting the early 1930s, um, doctors started noticing that when you um, injure certain part of the brain or stroke out certain part of the brain, uh, people with Parkinson's actually noticed that their movements, they are moving better. Their symptoms are getting better. So uh, then the lesioning procedure started to be done for the management of Parkinson's disease. Uh, in 1968, um, the levodopa carbidopa was developed, and people tend to respond very well to that medications. So there's a hiatus of the surgery. And afterwards, in 1990, uh, 1987, uh, the first deep brain stimulation was um, produced in the thalamus, and following that, uh, people started exploring DBS, deep brain stimulation in other parts of the brain, including the uh, globus pallidus and subthalamic nucleus, and uh, and those has the DBS has demonstrated good efficacy with less uh, adverse effects. So in ge uh, in general, those have been uh, has replaced the more conventional uh, lesioning approach. Uh, so the conventional lesioning approach usually is called something otomy. Uh, so there's thalamotomy, where you lesion the thalamus, or a specific part of the thalamus, uh, the, the VIM part, and then the pallidotomy, where you increase the, uh, you lesion the globus pallidus, or the G, uh, specifically GPI, the globus pallidus interna, and then subthalamotomy, where you uh, lesion the subthalamic nucleus. It uh, requires uh, sort of drilling a burr hole on the skull, putting in a fine probe into the uh, sort of targeted area of the brain under stereotaxic surgical and also electrophysiological guidance, and then use radio frequency to heat up the area and sort of uh, burn the area. Uh, the thalamotomy, uh, unilateral thalamotomy has been demonstrated to be very effective in controlling the tremor symptoms uh, on the other side of the body. 
the palatotomy, the lesion in the globus pallidus, uh, unilaterally has been demonstrated to improve the slowness of the movements, the dyskinesia, and also the stiffness, uh, mainly on, uh, on the sort of other side of the brain because the brain control is crossed, but also on the ipsilateral, the same side of the brain as well. Uh, the lesioning both sides of the brain uh, on the, uh, of the pallidus actually has been shown to cause uh, sort of permanent issues with speech and swallow. Um, and I think earlier this morning, there's a question regarding why the focused ultrasound is not done bilaterally, and that's part of the reason why. Um, and then for the subthalamotomy, the, uh, most of the evidence comes from uh, sort of sm uh, smaller and usual, uh, uncontrolled and unblinded studies, but it has also sh been shown to um, be effective in controlling the motor symptoms of Parkinson's to uh, decrease the wearing off and control the dyskinesia, increase the arm symptoms. Um, the unilateral uh, or the one-sided procedure has been shown to be a, as good as both sides of procedure with the caveat that the effect is not lasting as long. Uh, and then both sides of this procedure sometimes also has a higher risk of uh, side effects. So that said, we, we are entering into the DPS era where um, a electrode is uh, inserted into a specific part of the brain and a high frequency electric stimulation is given to help um, cause some local and also global effect in the brain to help modulate and regulate, regularize the network in the brain to uh, help with the symptoms. Um, here you can see that uh, the targets for DBS can usually in Parkinson's involve the, the globus pallidus, GPI, and also the subthalamic nucleus, STN, and with the electric stimulation and the electric field, and there's um, usually it uh, causes local effects where it tends to depolarize the um, ax the sort of the output of the neurons, and also it causes some electrical chemical changes in locally, and in that in turn or in addition also causes a uh, modulatory effect of the brain network. Um, additionally, there can also be a third target, the thalamus VIM, which is very effective for tremor and a tremor only. Uh, so for certain people, uh, sometimes VIM can be done to control the contralateral tremor symptoms. Uh, this slide is to show you that uh, also there are a lot of nearby structures uh, of those targets of uh, interest. And sometimes um, we use those struc structures, or let's say we use those effects to help guide us to know where we put the, uh, the DBS lead and also whether we have a good DBS place, uh, placement. This is just to show you one of the example um, sort of pivotal studies where they studied, uh, I think, six, 60 patients with STN DBS. Uh, 61 was GPI DBS and 134 was best medical treatment. Um, and as you can see, the dark blue bar is the uh, un good on time without dyskinesia. So uh, at six months, people with DBS has a, a good inc dramatic increase of the on time without dyskinesia. The red part is the off time, so there's a decrease of the off time. And uh, the, there's also some improvement of sleep, and as well as the reduction of dyskinesia and the reduction of medications. Uh, factors for successful DBS, patient selection, target selection, uh, good so, sort of social uh, supportive environment, uh, and a safe and adequate lead placement, as well as the post-operative programming optimization. At the University of Florida, we typically has a interdisciplinary evaluation of a person um, to, see, to assess their diagnosis, their uh, potential benefit of the DBS surgery, uh, their potential risks, and we make recommendations on how we would like to offer the surgery. And uh, the surgery is usually done in multiple steps, and uh, after, afterwards, uh, people 
usually come to us uh, monthly for about six months to achieve optimization of the programming. After that, usually the programming has been, can be fairly stable and then the frequency of the visits can be reduced to half a year to a year. Duration of DBS benefits. Uh, studies have shown that in general, the benefit of the muscle stiffness, the benefit of the tremor, and the benefit of the, uh, the sort of abnormal movement, dyskinesia, the motor fluctuations have been maintained over years. The early improvement of the bradykinesia, the slowness and smallness of the movement, as well as some early improvement of the axial or the center symptoms, those tend to start worse and decline again by five years out. Symptoms that were not responsive to levodopa to begin with, with the caveat of that medication refractory tremor, tend not to be helped by DBS and continue to worsen as expected with someone who's not undergoing the advanced therapies. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention earlier, um, when I talked about the VIM for tremor, uh, even though that's very effective for tremor, a lot of times uh, for people with Parkinson's, still the GPI and STN are uh, stimulated because the, the slowness of the movement, the rigidity usually start to develop and continues uh, over time. So those, uh, those two are usually the more preferable targets. Potential side effects of DBS can be characterized by those related to the sur surgery itself, um, like some small brain bleeds, uh, potential seizures, acute urinary issues during the uh, due to the surgery. Uh, or those related to the device, like the skin issues, pain, mechanical issues of the device, infections, or those long-term issues that are hard to tell uh, and potentially could be more due to the Parkinson's itself and then the out elderly population itself. The uh, cautions, so first, um, those with lack of resp uh, response to levodopa usually uh, don't respond too well to DBS was the caveat of the tremor. Um, dementia usually is a contraindication, uh, especially when it's severe. Uh, severe depression, usually that's a contraindication as well, at least that needs to be controlled. Um, and then if there's severe brain uh, shrinkage or there are lesions in the brain that prevents the uh, insert insertion of the lead to the targeted area of the brain, that can be a contraindication as well. Uh, as well as those uh, with contraindication to undergo surgeries in general. There are three brands of DBS uh, in the US, the Medtronic, the uh, Boston Scientific, and the Abbott. Um, nowadays, all devices are MRI, uh, full body MRI compatible, uh, the, at least the newer ones. Uh, in the past, there were, sometimes has uh, to, that has to be more, uh, it's more variable. Uh, some of the newer features of DBS, I think Dr. Ostrom also touched upon these. Uh, one is that uh, nowadays we can do chronic sensing of the brain so that we can listening to the communication and the signal inside the brain. Um, so imagine that you have the stadium. Uh, so while the electrode is stimulating, it can also listening to the brain signals. And also with the segmented leads, meaning that the uh, instead of a whole ring on a certain level, it's broken up into uh, two or three uh, segments of the lead facing 120 degrees apart. Um, we can also try to, uh, one, listening or hone in on the signal from a particular direction or particular part of the brain, and also stimulate or deliver more stimulation towards that particular part of the brain to uh, I'd hopefully achieve a better results. So with that, it opens up the possibility for uh, better understanding of the electrophysiology or sort of the meaning and the significance of the signals inside the brain. And it, uh, eventually that will allow for a adaptive approach of the DPS where the, we can tailor the stimulation towards your specific brain and how it's communicating with the, uh, other parts of the brain. Uh, there's also, Abbott has uh, come up with the ability to allow clinicians to program DBS remotely, which has come handy during the pandem uh, COVID pandemic. And now let's move on to focused ultrasound. Uh, so focused ultrasound has been studied, uh, first studied in animal models in 1942. And over time, it has been explored uh, to, uh, to sort of 
uh, ablates brain tumors or certain parts of the brain or to um, open up the blood-brain barrier for other reasons. Uh, in 2013, that was the first case where focused ultrasound was used uh, in people with, park, uh, with tremor to help with the tremor symptoms. And in 2016, I believe, uh, yes, 2016, that has been, um, the studies have shown that the focused ultrasound for the, to ablate the thalamus uh, is safe and effective for tremor, and that has been FDA approved. So the biological effects of focused ultrasound uh, first is thermal ablation, uh, thermal ablation where uh, so the energy, the high energy beam of the ultrasound is directed towards a certain part of the brain, so that you can basically burn that part of the brain off. Uh, for either a tumor or in the case of Parkinson's specific area of the brain, or it can be due to mechanical sort of shaking up the blood-brain barrier temporarily so you can deliver more medications into uh, areas of brain where drugs normally don't penetrate. Uh, with higher temporal or, and spatial resolution, and people have also been studying the neuromodulatory effect of focused ultrasound. Uh, the bottom sort of three panels are more for uh, early investigational purposes. Uh, you can increase the temperature of the brain, especially the tumor area, so that the tumor is more recognizable by your immune systems, or is more, uh, or you can uh, allow the de delivery of medications specifically to that area when you give the ultrasound and have a ultrasound responsive vehicle or it can be used to break up clots or a certain part of the tissue. There have been a lot of applications of focused ultrasound in the brain. Uh, it has been studied for people with major depressive disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, Alzheimer's disorders, uh, tumor, of course, uh, and then in the case of Parkinson's disease uh, or in the case of tremor. As we mentioned, the conventional lesioning earlier, so focused ultrasound is a new technology in the sense that it allows the destruction of the brain without the incision, but it's uh, not really not invasive in the sense that it still uh, targets the area to burn off a part of the brain. Um, so as you can see, there are multiple uh, various sort of ultrasound systems or transducers that can focus the beam uh, towards the targeted area of the brain. And then, I don't know if you can see the bottom, yeah, you can see a little bit. Um, so the little white area on the right side of the bottom MRI, that's uh, one day after the focused ultrasound procedure. And then uh, one week after the focused ultrasound procedure, you may see the white area got a little bit bigger. So that's a sort of the swelling and the tissue is, uh, the, destruction and remodeling, and then two months after, which is the third one, uh, you see that the uh, scar tissue has formed and then the area has got smaller. Uh, that's just a, another view to give you the idea of how the focused ultrasound is performed. The mechanism of lesion, so essentially you, uh, the, or the doctors use the stepwise approach to deliver a thermal dose uh, to a targeted area of the brain to burn off that area of the brain and then the cell undergoes cell deaths and then the inflammation, remodeling, and eventually scar formation. The, uh, some people may wonder what's the difference of focused ultrasound and a gamma knife. So focused ultrasound uh, uses non-radioactive ultrasound and then produces the immediate results where a gamma knife uses uh, radioactive beams and it can take weeks to months to start taking the effect. And because both procedures are incisionless and they need to go through the skin, the soft tissue of the skull, but sometimes it can uh, have under the effect where it doesn't cause the, sort of produce a brain or over the effect where it burns off more areas of the brain than intended. Studies have shown that for focused ultrasound to the thalamus, it improves tremor. Uh, and there have been studies exploring the focused ultrasound to other targets of the brain, like the globus pallidus, interna, and the subthalamic nucleus, to see if that's improved. It can improve the, the tremor in Parkinson's disease, as well as the improve the on time without dyskinesia and reduce the off time. The uh, benefits of the focused ultrasound, of course, is incisionalist. Uh, it doesn't require anesthesia. You go to get the procedure, go home the same day. 
um, but the limitation is that it can only be done for one side only because the lesioning, the conventional lesioning procedures show that doing both sides has a higher risk of side effects. Uh, because it's newer, we don't have a lot of long-term follow-up data, and then adverse effects can include headache, dizziness, uh, sort of room spinning, vertigo, the, some numbness, uh, tingling, gait problems, taste problems. And for some people, the tremor later recurs. Um, so LCIG, the, the, uh, so earlier I mentioned the sort of motor fluctuations, and it will be a good idea if you can deliver a steady concentration of the levodopa so that you don't have the ups and downs to avoid the side effects. And in Parkinson's, uh, people have GI uh, gut dysmobility, and uh, that also doesn't help when you take oral medication. Uh, so on the top right, uh, yeah, top right, it's a case report where someone took a medication one and a half uh, of the carbidopa levodopa one and a half hours before, and then when they do the endoscopy, they see the medication was sitting in the stomach, not dissolved, dissolved at all. So no wonder that's not working. So that comes the continuous levodopa carbidopa intestinal gel, or the duopa, where you, uh, you create a stoma in the stomach. Uh, the doctors insert a PEG J tube uh, with a gastric tube and then a, a jejunum tube extension. You connect that to a, a pump and then the cassette of levodopa carbidopa. And you can program that to give a morning bolus, a steady rate, and also as needed bolus when needed. And uh, you can sort of carry that cassette either around your neck or as a belt. Uh, in general, the administration is given, or the dose is given over a 16-hour period, and studies have shown that that's usually enough. Uh, for some people, over, when they have symptoms overnight, they may require a little bit of a, a carbidopa levodopa overnight. For rare patients, sometimes 24 hour of a, uh, infusion is needed, but the overnight doses usually is reduced by 30%. Uh, the uh, contraindications for levodopa carbidopa intestinal gel, so if you are on or recently received a non-selective monoamine oxidase inhibitor, uh, that can interact with medication, and that's, uh, that's not advised. And then the carbidopa, the duopa, usually you cannot abruptly stop stop it, so you either need to taper it or switch it to oral medications. This is just to showing you that Duopa is also uh, helping with reducing the off time, increasing the on time without dyskinesia. Uh, and the systematic reviews have sh uh, sort of confirmed those findings and also show that it has uh, additional benefits for motor and non-motor symptoms for Parkinson's. Uh, the effect usually is fairly quick uh, where you can sort of optimize the dose within seven days, and the effect lasts for years. Uh, the side effects or adverse effect usually are, uh, I know you cannot see it, but one, usually one side is related to the procedure itself. So you, uh, it requires diligent stoma care. It can cause infections, pain, and sort of lot, uh, blocking of the tube because you have to flush that tube daily. Uh, and then the other side effects are usually more in line with the effects from levodopa itself or the effects of uh, sort of that we see in elderly population. There's some data suggesting that people with uh, the levodopa to carbidopa intestinal gel may have a little bit higher risk of uh, neuropathy due to the various reduction of uh, sort of nutritional B vitamins and other uh, homocysteines, and sometimes that uh, taking the supplement is recommended. The continuous subcutaneous uh, apomorphine infusions are not available in the U.S. It's available in the European countries. But the idea is that so instead of giving levodopa carbidopa, um, they, they give dopamine, uh, the apomorphine, which is a very strong uh, dopamine receptor agonist that has the effect comparable to the uh, levodopa carbidopa. And then you do that subcutaneously under the skin, either in the belly or arms or the legs. Uh, and that gives you a continuous rate of the ap apomorphine. In the U.S., we do have an injectable version as well as a sublingual version of that. S again, same story, improve the uh, on time without dyskinesia, reduce the off time. For, uh, the side effects usually are skin related where you can, because of that needle, subcutaneous needle, you can develop skin nodules in 50% of patients. Sometimes it chronically can prevent the further use of the 
therapy. Uh, and then the, the effect that can be seen with the dopamine agonist, such as tiredness, the uh, nausea, vomiting, hallucinations, the uh, occasionally sleep, sudden sleep attack, or impulse control issues. Uh, and then uh, there have been some reports of a abnormal sort of a heart rhythms or a sort of um, uh, anemias due to breakdown of the blood. So some labs may be required. How do you choose between those therapies? Um, it kind of depends on your resource and on the, uh, your symptoms. In general, motor-wise, they are all good. Uh, they all improve the on time without dyskinesia, reduce the off time. There can be some subtle differences, but in general, they are all good. Uh, studies have shown that there can, sometimes when you take into the non-motor aspects of of the disease, the urinary issues, the blood pressure issues, the cognitive issues, that can help guide the clinicians to pick one over the other. Uh, and so if you have medication refractory tremor, DBS is the way to go. The other medic, the carbidopa, levodopa, intestinal gels, or the apomorphine pump are not going to help. Uh, if you have a lot of uh, cognitive issues, mood issues, DBS usually is not the way, and you might want to pick uh, uh, other therapies. If you have impulse control disorder, uh, the dopamine agonist will not be ideal. Comparing DBS and focused ultrasound, it's only improved for tremor, one-sided. Other benefits are still being studied. Uh, so to summarize, if you have disabling motor complications, in the US, DBS and the levodopa carbidopa intestinal gel, in Europe, you can also get the continuous subcutaneous apomorphine uh, in infusions. If you have refractory tremor, that's a DBS, uh, either to the GPI or STN, or more specifically to the VIM, and then the focused ultrasound to, to uh, lesion the thalamus. For people who have very limited resources, then the, either the conventional lesioning procedures or the ultrasound guided, uh, the focused ultrasound lesioning procedures may be considered. We're not going to spend much time on the investinal therapies, but Dr. Ostrom mentioned that there's uh, continuous subcutaneous levodopa carbidopa infusions uh, with two companies that are under uh, clinical trials. There's an uh, oral sort of dental retainer form of the levodopa carbidopa that's also under clinical trials that gives you a constant drip of the medications. Um, there has been gene therapy studied to uh, either improve the enzymes to, uh, to allow for more dopamine in the brain or sort of longer effect of dopamine in the brain or to increase production of, say, inhibitory uh, gabinergic signals in STN to block the, uh, to sort of reduce the hyperactivity of STN. There have been cell studies, uh, sort of cell-based therapies to try to implant dopamine-producing cells in the areas where you want more dopamine. Uh, this is a sort of a general slide to show you that we have a lot of therapies, either currently or uh, coming, uh, targeting various parts of the brain.